And that'll be the theme of our message tonight, trusting Jesus, as we look at rule number nine of the Red Sea Rules, going through this book by Robert J. Morgan together, making some applications as we're looking at Exodus 14. The God who leads you into the trial to face your Red Sea will lead you through. One way or the other, He will lead you through. So let's remember together some of these rules. So we'll put them up on the board. We'll say them out loud and uh, do what we can. Uh, yeah, it's on the board, so I guess you got no excuse, right? Not for memory. So let's do it together. Rule number one. Realize that God means for you to be where you are. He has made no mistakes. He has led you to a trial. He has a purpose in that trial. Rest in that. Number two, be more concerned for God's glory than for your relief. We are definitely selfish individuals by nature, and we need the Lord's help to recognize that there's a bigger plan going on, and He can open our eyes to that and we can get his perspective on it. Be more concerned for what he is doing than even our own relief. Number three, acknowledge your enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, the Bible says, but against principalities and powers, uh, rulers uh, in high places. Uh, So we definitely fight the spiritual warfare, but do not forget to keep your eyes on the Lord first and foremost. And we do this war by number four, Pray. Pray without ceasing. It is important for us to, in a trial, remember uh, that he should be our first uh, first phone call, so to speak. Turn to him first. Uh, He should not be a last resort, but our first recourse. Pray. Number five, stay calm and confident and give God time to work. Let's do it again. Number five, Stay calm and confident and give God time to work. We want it to happen now. Will God deliver me now? But just because He's not delivering you now doesn't mean that He's not doing something. Stay calm. Stay confident. What is that talking about? Faith. We'll be looking at faith tonight. And give Him time. He is working. Number six. When unsure, just take the next logical step of faith. Sometimes we freeze, deer in the headlights. We don't know what to do. Uh, You don't have to over-spiritualize it. You don't have to make it into some big, huge, grandiose thing. Just take the next step that makes sense in that moment, trusting God to lead. Number seven, envision God's enveloping presence. They had the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, and then it moved from the front to the back, provided a wall of protection against the enemy. And so it is today. We just can't see it. We can't see exactly how God takes care of us, but he does. I mentioned the parking lot a minute ago and kids running around the parking lot. Uh, Who knows how all the Lord works to keep our kids alive. We praise the Lord for that. Uh, But his presence is real. And sometimes we just need to stop and remember, God's with me. And take time to envision all the heavenly hosts that God has surrounded us with. His enveloping presence. He has never left us, nor will he ever forsake us. Number eight, together. Trust God to deliver in his own unique way. And he will do it in his own unique way. His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways and past finding out, but he will deliver in a way that only he can get the glory. And we need to trust him, lay our plans on the altar and just say, Lord, you deliver however you want to do it. And number nine is our new Red Sea rule for tonight. Let's say it together. View your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. Once again, number nine. View your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. So we'll pick it up in Exodus 14. And we, let's see here, let's take it to verse 21. Yeah, 21, I think is where we'll start. Exodus 14, 21. And we'll read on down through verse 31. The Bible says, 
And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning, in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the rest of the un, un, unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians, and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And it's amazing to me that it finally occurred to them in that moment that this was a bad idea. <laughs> you know, isn't that a head scratcher? Um, and the way it reads, if I'm imagining this correctly, uh, it says in the morning watch, this took place and it was, it was being separated all night long. Um, so the children of Israel moved down into this channel and the pillar of fire, the wall of protective fire of the Lord's presence moved behind them and the Egyptians just moved in after them. Uh, I always thought that the Egyptians came after them like super fast and at the last possible minute, the waters took them out. Actually, I don't think it really went down that way. I think that the women and children and donkeys and everything else are just kind of plunking along. Like, you know, and right behind them is the pillar of fire just plunking along. And here come the Egyptians after them, plunking along. <laughs> what are we doing in here? I guess we'll just follow this pillar of cloud and eventually hopefully we'll lift and we'll get our people back. I don't know. Uh, but he looked at them, the Bible says, through the pillar of fire. And then began, when he, ch when he chose, when he deemed it was right, he took off the, the uh, chariot wheels and, and discomfited them is the word. And they realized they had made a terrible mistake. They say, the Lord fighteth for them. And the Lord said unto Moses, verse 26, stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh came to the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. I saw a documentary that shows the divers going down to the spot where we think they may have crossed, and they found coral formations in the shape of wagon wheels. Some of them have the axles in between and the wagon wheels on both sides. And of course, there's nothing there. There's no wood or anything like that, but there is coral, because coral will attach to something. And then whatever the something is rots away and the coral is left. Uh, you, so it's, it's just neat to see some of those some of those things even today that help to verify, not that we need that verification, but it's fun uh, that this happened, folks. God can do this, and God did do this. So the Bible says in verse 29 that the, the children of Israel walked upon the dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw, verse 31, that the, uh, saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And that is our main text for tonight. The people feared the Lord and believed the Lord. I'm sorry, that got cut off on the screen. You have half the verse. Well, I'll finish the verse for you. Uh, the people... Uh, we'll start at the beginning. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. This was a moment where the people had finally come to faith, belief. Well, what brings us to faith? You're not going to like it. 
Well, let's start with prayer. Lord, help us to uh, be helped from your word tonight, and I pray that you would sharpen us and help us, Lord, to recognize how you use uh, Red Sea experiences in our life and trials and testings and even tribulations to, to work us uh, to work us over and work the fear out of us and the flesh out of us and ultimately to, to build us and change us and develop our faith. Help us, Lord, to be men and women of faith. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith is a spiritual muscle that you have to work out, if I can put it that way. And uh, just like an athlete puts their body through the rigors of, of working out and training, uh, so must we allow God to put us through some rigors and uh, uh, some difficulties that will train us spiritually. There are spiritual muscles. You know, when you're going to build a muscle, what do they do? What does the trainer do? He prescribes some uh, training routine, a.k.a. a um, torture routine, all right, and it puts you through the ringer, and your heart races, and the sweat drips, and you stretch muscles, and you tear muscles, and you contract muscles, and ultimately you're breaking muscle fibers down. If I understand this correctly, you're breaking things down so that it will heal stronger and grow back stronger. I probably did a terrible job of explaining that, but I just know it works. All right, guys, I will lift weights to hopefully become stronger. You have to be broken down until you can build back stronger. I just worked out on Monday with Brother Doug Wells, and he absolutely destroyed me. Uh, boy, Doug, if you're watching, sorry I'm telling on you. Uh, but man, 61 years old, and I, it was a two-hour workout, and I could not finish. Um, but I am still sore today, and I've not been able to do anything since Monday. I don't know if I'll do anything until Saturday. Uh, everything hurts. Now, the idea, why do you do that to yourself? Uh, to hopefully come back stronger, right? That's the goal, unless you injure yourself. And uh, you will allow yourself, you'll endure difficulty to be able to get the end result. Well, so it is spiritually. There are trials, there are tribulations, there are difficulties that we endure spiritually, and these trials are trials of faith, ultimately, that work patience and that build us to the point where, not that we're ever perfect in this life, but to the point where we can say, I've seen God do this before. I, I, I'm going to be just fine. He's going to take me through. I've been here before. I was complaining to Brother Doug on Monday about how hard the workout was, and he says, well, that's because you're doing my workout. I'm used to this. If I did your workout, I'd be the one crying. And there, there's some truth to that, some. So that makes me feel better, right? Uh, you know, he's, you've been there before. You know what to expect. You've worked that muscle. And that's the benefit of trials. That's the benefit of Red Sea experiences in our lives. You can say, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. This looks a lot like the Red Sea. I've been here before like five, six times. And God did this and this and this and this and this and this. Well, pop the popcorn, pull up a chair. Let's see what God's going to do. Now, that's a faith perspective, but how does that, how do you get to that point? Not that I'm, I'm kind of being silly there, but how do you get to that point where you really can trust the Lord? Well, you are, you are, you've, you've gone through God's gym, if you will, of trials and agonizing and training uh, Robert J. Morgan said, this, said it this way, trials and troubles are the dumbbells and treadmills for the soul. Everybody has faith. Even atheists have faith. You made hundreds of decisions today, and most of them you made by faith. You drove, and my wife, of course, had a lot of faith on the way over here. We're driving in pouring rain. I'm driving too fast, and I mentioned, boy, the brakes aren't as responsive. And she's like, yeah, I noticed. Go a little slower. We're going to hydroplane. We're going to die. Uh, my kids and my wife had a lot of faith, I think. It was clinging faith, but it was faith. Uh, you know, anything you do, you've got faith in the chair that you're sitting in right now. Uh, you had faith 
that your car was going to not blow up. Uh, you, you have faith that the food you ordered from McDonald's wouldn't kill you. That's a lot of faith. <laughs> um, people live by faith all the time. <clears throat> But God is looking for people with faith specifically in Him. A couple of verses here that will encourage us, I believe, as we uh, get into this. Luke 1.45, And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. God honors people of faith. And this is, uh, this is speaking of Mary. Mary believed what was told her. And what happened? God came through. She was a woman of faith. God blessed her. Who else were people of faith in the Bible? Romans 4.20. Uh, it's speaking of Abraham. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Abraham was a man of faith. Mary was a woman of faith. And God came through on his promises to both of them. And God was able to perform that which he had, uh, had spoken. We walk by faith every day, as I mentioned. You have faith in your car. You have faith in your chair. Uh, but do we have faith in God? God is looking for those who will step out upon him with simple assurance, rest, and reliance couple other people we'll talk about who had faith. Paul was one who was a man of faith. Acts 27, 21. The Bible says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. He's on the ship in the middle of a storm. They think they're going to die. And he says, Sirs, should ye have hearkened, uh, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. That's the old, see, I told you so. Hey, Paul can do it. And now I exhort you, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there shall be, I'm sorry, for there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Isn't God good? He didn't just spare Paul, he spared all these guys. They weren't even believers. They were probably, you know, wicked men, many of them. But God says, I'm going to give them all to you. I wonder if Paul had prayed for that. It's not in there, but I wonder if Paul said, save us, save us all. And God said, I will. Verse 25, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Here it is. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. What kind of faith are we zeroing in on here tonight? Not just the faith that your chair will hold you up, but the faith that what God has spoken, He will perform. Those verses you memorized in Kids Club weren't just kids' stuff. God will follow through on what He has said. It's fact, not fiction. That's the kind of faith we're zeroing in on and the faith of the children of Israel as they stood at that Red Sea and saw it part was that faith that is realizing God does what He says. And again, in verse 31 there, uh, how did it finish? The Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. The people feared God and believed the Lord. They're a little bit late to the party, but at least they got there. <laughs> it is easier to believe God after you've seen the great work. But you know what? That... That is what God does with us as well. We have clinging, trembling, weak faith during the trial, but God's building it and building it, and then we see the conclusion and how God worked, and our faith is built even more. We say, boy, I, I believe God. Uh, what else here? Hebrews 11, verse 11, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Do you see something with all these verses we've mentioned so far? Paul says, I believe God that he'll do what he told me he would do. Abraham, 
believe God because a promise that he had promised he was able to perform. Uh, uh, Mary believed God because what the angel said would happen, she believed would happen. And now Sarah, Sarah conceived seed miraculously. Why? The Bible says here's why, because she had the faith to believe God. That she judged him faithful who had promised. Folks, faith that we're zeroing in on tonight is about what you know of God in his character and what you know of what he's spoken by way of promises and saying, God, you're faithful. Now, generally speaking, when we talk about faith, the faith decisions we make all day long, uh, that kind of faith is making reasonable assumptions. I assume that guy in oncoming traffic will stay in his lane. So by faith, I will drive past him at 65 miles an hour in the rain. That is actually a lot of faith, right? Uh, but we do it all the time. I have faith that this plane will stay in the sky. I don't have much faith on that one, but I do fly when I have to, and I do a lot of praying at takeoff. Uh, I have faith that the elevator will deliver me safely to the 11th floor or whatever the case may be. But for the Christian, for the Christian now, it's more than that. For the Christian, we are talking about this, not just faith making reasonable assumptions. Faith makes biblical assumptions. The Bible says it. Jesus doesn't lie. This is a fact. This is a promise. I can assume that God's going to carry this out. And I move forward in good faith that what he said he is able to perform, I expect it to be so. And I want you to know God rewards that. And all the way through the New Testament, you see Jesus Christ singling out people of faith and rewarding them. Matthew 8, verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say to you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. How many times did we hear Jesus say something like that? It was over and over and over. He was looking for people of faith, and if he saw someone, he didn't care how much money they had, he didn't care who their dad was, it didn't matter what their relationship was with the, with the synagogue. It was, let me talk about your faith. This guy or this girl has more faith than I've ever found. Matthew 15, 28, same thing. And he answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Sometimes we super spiritualize this, like there are great men of faith and great women of faith. And there's the rest of us peons down here that are just hoping that God will give us something in his spare time, maybe. It's never been like that in the, in the Bible. Like where, what, what verse do we associate that with? Uh, all of these people that Jesus calls out for their great faith, they were nobody... But what made them somebody was just the fact that they were willing to cash it all in on Jesus. Just put it all on Jesus and say, I believe he's going to do what he said he would do. That should encourage each one of us, folks. Any person here can be a man of faith, a woman of faith that God will see and God will respond to. It's not that we're manipulating God by our faith. Name it and claim it, and if you have enough faith, blah, 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 you do whatever you want. No, it is that we are cooperating with God to do what he already wants to do. Faith accesses grace. God already wants to do it, but in his, in his um, design, he has to have an individual who will trust him by faith. All right. Well, what of us who cry out, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Isn't that where we often find ourselves? That weak faith. Well, the Lord also honors those who have the clinging faith and not this uh, overpowering faith. Uh, and, and praise the Lord, He is merciful in that regard. Many of us, we have a weak faith because of fear. So I want to talk about the relationship of fear and faith. You saw in our text in verse 31... The people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So fear is only supposed to be a fear of God, all right? That's the only kind of fear we're supposed to have is the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. 
but a fear of man or a, just a general fear is the, uh, the antithesis of faith. It undermines faith. It's at war with faith. So if we're going to be men and women of faith, we've got to understand the relationship of fear with faith. Recognize that when we are standing at the Red Sea, you're going to have a lot of fearful thoughts. You've got to deal with those, though, by the grace of God, to be able to walk forward in faith. Uh, Mark 4, 39 and 40 says, He arose, Jesus arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And folks, just recognize that's how it usually always goes. When you're fearful, you have no faith. But when you're full of faith, you're usually more courageous, less fear. Not that you're fearless, but faith has brought you past that place of the restraints of fear. Fear will try to keep you in a certain amount of safety. And faith says, I'm entrusting my safety to the Lord. I am, I'm trusting Him to keep me. And therefore, you're able to go outside the comfort zone and see what God can do. So let's talk about fear for a little bit. Fear doubts the certainty of God's promises, thus eroding one's capacity for faith. So let's, let's see a couple things. Why do I fear? Well, I fear because I'm not in control. But what does faith do? Faith rests in the fact that God is in control. So remember, if you're fearing because you're losing control, recognize what's lacking in your life at this moment is a faith that God has got this totally under control. It is a relationship issue. Your fear is a relationship issue. It has to do with your relationship with the Father. I fear because I don't know how it ends. Does that ever scare you? How does this play out? This is scary. We look at politics. We look at uh, health diagnosis. And we look at all sorts of things. And this is really, really scary. How does it end? And if it was a book, we would just skip to the last chapter. Well, what does faith do in these, circum these circumstances? Faith rests in the fact that God is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And so it's hard when you don't know the end to say, but he does, so I'm okay. That's tough. But you've done it before, not just with God, you've done it with your parents. At one time or another, you were with your parents as a kid and you were scared out of your mind, but they knew how it ended and they had peace and that peace helped you have peace. For my kids, it's the... Um, it's, what, do we, what do we even call it? We call it the monster, uh, the, the car wash. The car wash has scared every one of my kids out of their minds. And so we've, we've done different things to make it less scary. Uh, not now, Samuel's fine. I mean, he's had a little bit of PTSD, but he's good. No, <laughs> no. It's like Erica. Er, Erica's still in that stage. When, when they're in the one, two, three years old, the going through the car wash scares them out of their minds. So I would sometimes go to Myers and get a box of donuts and give them a donut and they'll eat the donut. But then, you know what? Nobody has an appetite when they're scared out of their mind. So a lot of times the donut's like sitting there. <laughs> you know? uh, the monster's after my donut. But um, I say, hey, I know how this ends. It's going to be okay. You get through this. We have a clean car. Dad's happy. You had a donut. You're happy. Everybody's happy. I know how it ends. You don't. Trust me on this. And so it is with us. Why do we fear? We're out of control. We don't know how it ends. That rec that, that's showing me I have a relationship problem. I'm not resting in my Father's control and the fact that He is the beginning and the end. Uh, let's go through these. I feel alone and forsaken. I, so I, I, I fear because I feel alone and forsaken. Well, what does faith do? It rests in the promise that God will never leave me nor forsake me. And you don't have both at the same time. You're either fearing because you're alone and forsaken, or you're saying, I'm rejecting that fear 
resting in the promise of God. I fear because I don't believe I'll have the strength to go through with this. Somebody says, I, I, I'm afraid I'll never make it through this trial. This is too big. Well, what, is, what does faith do? Faith rests in His all-sufficient grace for this moment and the next moment, this step and the next step. That's one of our rules. Take the next step of faith, right? Fear says, I can't go on. Faith says, I'm going to trust Him for the next step. I'm going to trust Him for the next step. Fear says, I think my life is ruined. It's over. This trial has done me in. Faith rests in the God of new, be new beginnings. Fear says, I believe I've wasted my life. All these trials, and I've just, I've not done it right. I messed this up. I messed that up. It's over. But faith says, I'm resting in the God who works all things together for good. Romans 8, 28. What does fear do to faith? It says, I'm afraid of becoming weak and vulnerable. And the, tri the trials will do that, right? What is the trial doing? It's breaking you down before it builds you back stronger. Just like the gym. But we don't like feeling weak. We don't like feeling vulnerable and sore. What should we do? What does faith do in that situation? Faith rests in omnipotence and divine strength. And folks, sometimes God has to take us to a place where self-sufficiency has its back broken. Because some of us are very, very self-sufficient individuals. We're very, very strong. And we can do it all by ourselves. We're like that three-year-old who says, I can do it by myself. Uh, we've got, yeah, one right now. I can do it by myself. <clears throat> and some of us never grew up from that. We're still doing that to the Lord. I can do it by myself. And the Lord says, let me take you through a trial because you're never going to get to know me as long as you think you can do everything by yourself. And God, he, it, it looks for all the world like he hates you. Looks for all the world like he's upset with you. But he doesn't hate you. He's not upset with you. He's trying to bring you to a place where you recognize how much you need him. Don't be afraid of being weak. When you're weak, then you're strong, Paul said. What else are we afraid of? We're afraid that... Uh, this trial will never end. I think that's the next one. Yeah. I'm afraid this trial will never end. I have felt that. You have probably felt that. It, it's going to be like this forever. This is never going away. I'll tell you what, sometimes the devil can paralyze us with that fearful thought. You ever been just stopped dead in your tracks when you had the realization that this particular thing I'm facing it's going to be here forever. That'll just cripple you. But it's not true. It's totally false. What does faith do? Faith rests in the fact that God will not tempt me above that which I am able. And I should have put some more stuff on there. I got it in my notes anyway. Uh, Proverbs 23, 18. This is a great verse. Somebody needs to memorize this verse. Proverbs 23, 18. I wrote it in my margin here, so I got to turn my thing sideways. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Somebody needs to memorize that one. Because you're like, will it ever end? Will it ever stop? Yes! There's your verse. Write it down. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. You're not, it's not over for you. You're just cut off right here. Your story is done. No! Faith says I'm going to rest and the fact that God is with me, He will not crush me under this, and this will eventually pass. That's helped me more than once to just stop and say out loud, this day will pass. This issue will pass, and there will be a time where I'll be able to look back and talk about this in past tense. Now, it might not happen for a long time. But just the fact that I know that everything will eventually be behind me, it does help. The devil will try to say, no, you're never ever, ever going to be free of this. You're going to be under this forever, and it's just going to get worse and worse, and you're going to be ground to nothing. Don't listen to him. It's not true. It's a lie. Faith rests. What else? I'm afraid of failing God and disappointing others. 
going through this trial and you're like, I'll never make it. I'm not going to be a man of faith. I'm not going to be a woman of faith. This is just horrible. I'm going to fail God and disappoint everybody. No, faith rests in the God who is able to keep you from falling and present you spotless in that day. I'm afraid. Fear says I'm afraid of what the future will bring. But faith rests in the God who has already been there. The God who, the Bible says, inhabits eternity. I am recognizing for myself when I am really struggling in various trials and various circumstances, though those struggles are telling on me. They're telling on me that I am not trusting the Lord like I should, like I could, and that there is something with my relationship with God right now that is distant as far as faith is concerned. I'm not saying you're a bad Christian or that you're a wayward Christian. I mean, uh, sometimes good Christians forget to trust the Lord. Just look at Elijah when he ran from God. Look at Jonah when he ran from God. So many good Christians, they had a great relationship with God. And yet at this moment in time, they're just not trusting God. We have a reality check, or in this case, a faith check. Oh boy, I'm out of time. Let me just finish this real quick. So the, the, the key battleground between the war of fear and faith, I believe, is in 1 John 4:18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. This verse, if you have a problem right now with fear, you need to know 1 John 4.18. Sometimes we go to bed with fears and we wake up with fears and then the fears just stay all day and they stay all week. And, and uh, we live under a cloud of fear and agitation and anxiety. Uh, well, we don't just have a faith problem. We have a love problem. These things are, are related uh, the more assured I am of my Father's love for me, the less I have to fear. And love from the Father and my faith in the Father are like this. Uh, let me explain. Uh, father-child relationship. You know, some kids have such a faith in their parents, it's almost scary. Like they trust their parents implicitly. And parents can let you down, right? Right? Uh, but why do they trust their parents like that? Because they're secure in the love they have from their father and their mother. Therefore, they trust them. And I've told this before when Joel and I were sitting there when he had the Lego in his lung and we're waiting to go in and be seen by the doctor so they can get the Lego out of his lung. Every time he breathed in and out through his mouth, he whistled through that Lego. And it was unnerving for me as a dad. I'm like, what is going on here? How are they going to get a Lego out of his lung? I was terrified. Joel was very scared, but Joel looked up at me and he says, Dad, you're always going to be with me, right? I said, yeah, I'm not going nowhere. And he looked right back down to what he had in his hand and he was totally calm. That's all he needed. You're always going to be here, right? You are? Okay, good. Yep, we're good. So he was calm. I was still scared. And so I looked for my dad. And he wasn't there. He's in South Carolina, you know? So what did I have to do? I had to look to that dad. Lord, you're always going to be with me, right? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Okay, we're good. And the Lord got us through. And of course, uh, they pulled that Lego out and he's been uh, playing with Legos ever since with his hands on his teeth. But as we have the assurance of the Father's love, faith comes right in. It's just natural. It, it, it's, it's, um, they're inseparable. Fear enters into the picture when you're insecure about does God love me or does he not? When I'm secure in my Father's love for me, my faith is full. I know he loves me. I know his promises are for me and he's going to follow through. But when I'm insecure in my Father's love for me, my fears are unleashed. Does God really love me? Does God really care? Is God, let, is God going to let this happen? Is God, God going to let it go on forever? Will it ever end? And, and what's going to happen? And where, oh, what about this? What about that? No, it's because you have, again, there's a relationship problem. I've been saying it this whole time. There's a relationship issue. 
You need to get back to the matter of security in your relationship, his love for you, your love for him. I'll tell you, my worst fear as a kid was being separated from my parents. There was nothing else. Talk about cancer, I don't care. Just as long as my dad's there, it's fine. As, as long as my mom is there, I'm fine, <laughs> you know. Uh, I did not want to be separated from my parents. But when I had that assurance that they were here and they loved me, perfect love casts out fear. And when perfect love casts out fear, faith is there. Are you struggling with faith? Are you struggling with fear? Perhaps you need to back up. Let's just let fear and faith sit for a second and back up and say, what about my relationship with God? Am I convinced He loves me unconditionally? And sometimes we say, we focus on you loving God. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying focus on God loving you. Sometimes we, we get all uh, 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 self-focused, like, I've got to love God more, I've got to love God more. Well, the next verse goes on to say we loved Him because He first loved us. Step back and focus on His love for you. And then, of course, your love for Him is a response to that love. And as you are secure in His love for you, perfect love casts out fear and faith will be full. What's the alternative? Well, it's right there on your screen. Fear hath torment. And if any of you in this room have ever lived in a period of fear, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have lived tormented days. And I am here to say unapologetically to you, that's not God's plan for his children his plan is not for you to live out your days in torment, the torment of fear that has always been throughout Scripture what you see associated with the judgment of God upon His enemies. It's not for His children. Why then do we find ourselves in that camp? We're not thinking like a child. We're not thinking about His love for us, our security in that relationship. He is my Father. It's all fine. Perfect love casts out fear. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So folks, if you're struggling with this, don't feel bad about it. You're human just like me. We struggle with stuff. Work on your relationship with God, recognizing his love for you. So we'll finish with this. How can God build my faith through the trial, my Red Sea trial? Well, number one, submit to the trial. This is in itself an act of faith. Submit to the trial. God has brought me to the Red Sea. He's not made a mistake. I'm not going to fight this. I'm going to believe he knows what he's doing. And so, Lord, I'm submitting. Fighting the trial is an evidence of fear. Fight or flight mode, man. Submitting is an evidence of faith. Secondly, recognize that this trial won't last forever. I already mentioned that before. This too shall pass. And this is an act of faith. As you recognize this won't last forever, it's an act of faith because you're believing God's going to move you through. God's got a purpose. He has a plan. This is a process. I'm somewhere in the process, and you know what? Hallelujah. I'm further along today than I was tomorrow. So let's check off a day on the calendar, and let's keep moving through. Number three. Focus on growth. That's a faith perspective in a trial. Not focus on, will it stop? Will it go away? Make it stop! No, 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 no. Focus on, i got to get everything out of this that I possibly can because this is God's plan for me. And I don't want to repeat this, by the way. You know, <laughs> I don't want to have to go to trial number two because I missed trial number one. I flunked. So let's focus on growth. It takes faith to believe that what God is doing is good. It takes faith to believe that this is not just a breaking process. This is a growing process. It takes faith to believe that God is working this together for good and that you're going to be a better person for, the, for this trial. And it takes faith to look at a trial and say, I'm going to squeeze every last drop out of this for my good, the world's good, and the glory of God. And let God grow you and then praise Him along the way. Praising takes faith. And that will be 
Spoiler alert, Red Sea number 10 will deal with praise. So let's review. Red Sea rule number nine. View your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. Say it with me, number nine. View your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. God has not abandoned you. He has not decided to just beat you up for the fun of it. He is trying to mold you and make you and grow you into the person he has designed for you to be in the image of Jesus Christ.